we were really clear from the beginning of our challenge and from Naraku Taki Taki that we had to make a difference. We had to plug gaps, we had to pull systems together, we had to leverage off of other people's investments and we had to start getting communities and researchers to work together to share knowledge, to share dollars uh, and to ensure that we weren't overlapping and investing in the same areas and just duplicating work because that was never going to save a Cody tree. And ultimately that's what I was driven by was the Tornau from Kevin Prime to save one tree. Just save one tree, he said. If you save one tree, then maybe we can save the others. It's really, really enlightening. It's, it's fascinating. And I find, what I personally find really, really interesting is, as a pathologist, a lot of the training that we have aligns to uh, a lot of what I see with Māori knowledge. And so, for instance, the disease triangle, that part where of them, it's not the host and the pathogen. That environment part is so critical. And it's that understanding, it's that whole ecosystem, it's the holistic part of it. And I do find that quite exciting when you can see those parallels and there's that moment of connection um, where you realise you're on exactly the same page, you've got the same goals, you've got the same understanding, you just expressed it in a different way. So host pathogen environment is around those three areas, the host, the pathogen, and the environment, and the interaction of them. So in pathology, we have what you'd call a disease triangle, and that disease triangle is those three parts. And so to get to disease, you have to have a susceptible host, you've got to have the pathogen, and you also have to have the right environment. And if one of those factors is missing, you won't get disease. And so it's a really, really critical part. And so that's what the whole premise of it is around, is um, those attributes and how they contribute to disease. Our particular theme isn't about any forms of management but the information that we that we discover or that we find is passed through to other themes that will then use it. For instance, conservation and restoration. If you're wanting to restore a site, having that understanding of how long or how that spread occurs for going from one region to another region is really, really important. And so that's the kind of information that we can feed on. From my perspective, I think host pathogen and environment is a theme that really, um, from a, Western perspective um, marries up um, really nicely with with a uh, with a Chao Māori worldview because from my experience in um, working in the Cody Dieback um, space and and other spaces, um, there is often a focus just on the pathogen or or just on isolating out um, particular parts of a research area or question, whereas the environment part of host pathogen environment is the holistic um, sort of ngahere type approach that um, mana whenua have been asking for or for, for a very long time when they've been involved in Cody dieback myrtle rust. They're interested in the health of the ngahere as a whole and how all these interrelated elements of the ngahere um, affect each other. I think it's a way of looking at these you know, these ngarara, these, these um, pathogens that are impacting on our taonga species, but looking, looking at them themselves, but also how they interrelate with all our other taonga species and the taio as a whole. So we have four main research areas that are to do with Western science. And so the first one is looking at uh, the drivers that cause kauri dieback disease. And so in that one there we're looking to see where the pathogen is in the soil, how long it takes to spread from one area to another, uh, when it does spread, how long it takes for a tree to become infected, and then when the tree is infected, how long it is until you see disease expression occurring, and then also within that, how what different types of disease expression that you have. Um, so that's really, really important for this particular theme is understanding all of that and the, the more we can understand the better we will be able to uh, manage the disease. 
The second thing that we have is very similar to that and it's to do with myrtle rust. And so again, it's the same principles. And Cody dieback and myrtle rust are both really devastating diseases, but they're actually very different. So Cody dieback is a soil-borne pathogen. It's a phytophthora species, so it's in the, a kingdom called Oomycetes. Myrtle rust is an eerily spread pathogen and it's a fungal species. So they're completely unrelated kind of pathogens and they also have very different modes. One's air, one is through the soil. And so with myrtle rust, it's the same principles as with Cody dieback. We need to understand the spread, but we do it in a different way because it's aerial. We're looking to see uh, how it can go from one plant to another. And in particular with myrtle rust, it needs to have a new flush. And so when it sees the new flush, it can infect the leaves and, and then that's where the disease occurs. It doesn't affect the older leaves on the plant, it's just that new flush that comes in. So if we can understand, and this takes us back to that host uh, triangle, if we can understand when the tree has a flush, then we can start to understand when that tree is going to be susceptible. And that means if we have management or control practices, we can kind of target when you're going to get disease. And then on top of that for diseases like myrtle rust, uh, it's very dependent on the environmental conditions. There's certain times of the year where it is really, really bad. So in particular, it's the summer months. It's about January through to May in particular. It's really, really bad. If you go out to some sites in January, February, they can be completely yellow. And so, but we need to kind of figure out when that happens. It's going to be different for Northland versus the central part of the North Island versus the bottom part and the game for the South Island. It all will vary. And so that's what we're trying to get a handle on is what are the environmental triggers, in particular the um, weather conditions that you get an infection of myrtle rust. And as I said, that's so that if we understand that, then we can put those control and management options through. Then we have another two RAs, and both of those are around the pathogen genome. And so the first uh, one of those RAs is looking at Phytophthora agathodicida, which is the pathogen that caused Cody dieback. And for that one there, we're in the process of uh, assembling a new, really high quality genome for that pathogen. So we've had a genome in the past, but it wasn't the best quality genome. And the better quality it is, the more information and the more targeted the response that you can get from it is. And so that's why we've gone back and um, made it into a really, really good quality genome because it's going to provide us better information long term. And so the importance with the genomes is if you can understand how the pathogen infects, if you can understand what it's doing, why it likes these hosts, then you've got the opportunities to find different kinds of control mechanisms or find different ways that you can stop the pathogens. There's a lot of different things. So just understanding um, how that's functioning is a really important part in, in looking at control management options. And so we've got work, as I said, that we're doing on Phytophthora agathodicida, and then we also have work that we're doing on Ostropraxinia sidii, and that's the pathogen that causes myrtle rust. Myrtle rust has clearly got a lot shorter history in New Zealand. It's been here since 2017. It's believed to have blown across from Australia. And so the time it's been present here is much shorter. But again, we started off in the first days learning as much as we could about how this pathogen functions in the New Zealand environment. We knew a lot of information from what's happened overseas. The pathogen originally comes from South America and it's slowly spread to many of the areas in the world that have mut mutaceae. And that's a family of plant species known as the myrtles and includes Pahutakawa, Rama Rama, Manuka, Kanuka, Rata. Um, and there's a huge number of plants within this family that are all over the world. And it's a very unusual rust. Most rusts would only infect one or two hosts. This one is known to have over 400 host species that are susceptible. So it's really different and it's called a pandemic a biotype, the actual strain that goes around the world. And that's because it's got to the point where it's causing disease in so many countries. Similar to COVID, it reached that point where it becomes a pandemic and that's what we're seeing with myrtle rust. That's what we're hoping to achieve with the myrtle rust work as well, is 
providing more information. Hopefully we'll be able to have models that come out at the end of this program so people can look up the region that they might be in, see what the weather's going to be like. Is that, does that mean we've got a greater risk of myrtle rust? It might change some of our practices for, of what we do. It might change when you go into the bush. It might change when you move materials around. There could be some small changes, but they could have a significant impact on preventing spread or managing it. But we need to put that information into the New Zealand context. And so, and again, this is where working with mana whenua kaitiaki is really important because it's pulling that that knowledge that's sitting there and, and enabling those right decisions to be made when you have that information about the pathogen and you can combine that with um, the own indigenous knowledge of the land, of the plants, of the connections of that whole environment. I suppose that's a misconception about myrtle rust when it first came. Everyone thought it was this big yellow uh, pathogen that you'd see everywhere and, and it's not like that. It's it is everywhere, but it's slow. It's really, really slow, and it's just a, a slow killer of these trees. And so each year it goes back and infects that new flush. That new flush can't survive, and the tree might put out a couple of branches of, of new material, but in general, no. And so then the next year it comes along. Again, it puts out its new material, a couple of leaves, or however many leaves may get infected, but not all of them. But the tree just slowly and slowly can't cope and the point where it actually dies is where it collapses because it just can't continue itself. And so it's not that the pathogen comes in and it just kills it straight off there and there. It's this very, very slow process and that's the part what we don't understand is how long will the trees die if they become infected? That's one really important question that we need to understand. And then if they are going to die, how long is that process going to take? Where can we step in and, and make a difference or, or what? of our native mutaceae are the most vulnerable that we need to protect. Myrtle rust is a really, really sad story. And in Australia, they're already seeing um, localised extinction of some of their mutaceae. We are starting to see the first death of certain species. There was a recent um, report from the east coast of some of the trees over there, Ramarama, that have died. Some of those were mature trees over five metres high through to little seedlings. Um, some of the work that we've been doing is going into the forest to monitor the progression of myrtle rust in some of these species to see what's actually happening. And when we have looked, we found that all of the seed of the ramarama has been infected with myrtle rust. So that seed's therefore unable to produce a seedling. Then you look into the understory, the seedlings are starting to die or have already died from myrtle rust. So for ramarama, you've got a huge issue. We've got a pathogen that can kill a tree that's five metres plus in height. It can kill all of the, uh, or infect all of that fruit, but then it's also killing the, the juveniles, the seedlings that are coming through. There's been a couple of mātauranga Māori um, projects sort of in development for host pathogen and environment. One of them has had to be sort of parked for now because of, you know, COVID and our inability to engage with our Pacifica um, whanaunga as we would have liked to, which was which was kind of a he putake origins um, of pathogen type um, of project. Uh, in the in the meantime, what we are doing is we are intending to work on a um, kuanga or, or he tupu or te kauri, um, type project. So again, uh, coming back to the sort of wider environmental perspective, it's, it's kind of looking future forward at climate change um, related impacts and what this might mean for kauri. So whether kauri are, um, you know, um, producing bud um, earlier because of a changing, a warming climate and what that means, whether um, there might be different climatic conditions in different parts of the country. So what we're going to be looking at is some of our, um, the biodiversity um, management areas, um, mana whenua that are part of the Te Whakahonanga program have earlier been engaged in uh, a Healthy Trees, Healthy Futures project with Scion and there is quite a lot of Taonga um, kauri seedlings uh, sitting in Rotorua 
and we're intending to train kaitiaki to bring them down, um, get some nursery skills and learn how to take radial measurements and um, look at bud, measuring bud bursts and things like that and against temperature. And then we're going to take, repatriate some of our own taonga, our seedlings back to Ngahire, into, into um, Rohe and plant them out and do um, measurements um, in situ in the Ngahire. This is going to align with some of the work that Waitangi probably talked about, so the Tohu um, or Te Maramataka um, project. So when um, Kaitiaki are out recording various Tohu cultural indicators, um, marama, Maramataka related um, information, we will be looking at these seedlings that get planted out and measuring them and checking for um, tipu, but we will also be looking at, at other cues or tohu like bird song, wind, um, and, and other, um, you know, other tohu like that as part of this um, project. So yes, so that's, it's still in development, but it's pretty exciting and it has like a, yeah, a longer term sort of informing uh, role for what, what might happen to our Cody um, in the future when, when things, when the seasons start to change, when we start to get this um, seasonality, maramataka cues happening potentially earlier than they would have normally and what that means. And that's the combination in particular in areas where kauri and myrtle rust, or kauri and myrtles are combined, you've got two diseases which are having massive impacts on the ecosystem. So it's not only looking at these ones that myrtle rust might be infecting and killing, then you've got the natural sort of extinctions or vulnerability that we already had in New Zealand before myrtle rust came over, and then for where that overlaps with kauri dieback or kauri, then you've got multiple levels of vulnerabilities of these plant communities or ecosystems and putting on top of that is possums. How many triggers can they withstand before they succumb and can't, can no longer cope? So there is a lot I think that the individual can do, just to, the, the same with kauri dieback, being very conscious about what you take into a forest what you do with your clothes, with your belongings when you come out of the forest and where you're going next. And that would be the same for many of the, the pests and pathogens we have in New Zealand, whether it's in our aquatic system, whether it's in the land. Being really conscious about where we've been and where we're going and cleaning the clothes. And it can be wiping your shoes, it can be um, changing your clothes, making sure you wash them before you go into another area. If you work frequently in forests, really, really washing all of your clothes and cleaning your boots. Um, anyone who's regularly in a forest, I always think, should have the cleanest boots in the world because they should be cleaned every single time you come out. There shouldn't be a scrap of dirt on them. Um, that's a really practical, simple way that everybody can contribute. If we don't do it, what are we left with? If a tree or an ecosystem becomes devastated to the point that there's no return, what will you be going back to? If you're a hunter, is that really going to be an area that you're going to be having a lot of animals to hunt? If you are going for the beauty of the bush, is that going to be an area that's filled with that same level of beauty? So it might be a small sacrifice, and it's not really even a sacrifice, but it might be a small thing that you've got to do that you can do and that everyone can do. And if everyone does do it, it does make that difference. And it's no different between that and when we talk about COVID. If everybody does something little, it makes a big difference when it's multiplied across everybody who might be accessing those lands. One of the things that I really like in particular about Naraka Taki Taki, which has been very different from what we've had before, is traditionally, and how I was brought up, so to speak, as a scientist, is you, you had a very Western science um, training and there's particular processes and things you do. So when I started off from science, we never went out and asked permission of mana whenua. I will quite truthfully say I didn't understand a lot of, of what I understand now about the relationship and what's important. 
but I've been really lucky and so there's some fantastic Māori co-leaders within Nga Rākau Takitaki who've spent the time talking with myself and with other scientists and they've explained those concepts, they've explained why they're important and I get it now and that's a huge part and I think for a lot of Western scientists being able to open your mind and hear, listen, understand but then also be active in what you do afterwards and that's what I think is fantastic about Nga Rākau Takitaki it's it's pulling together Western scientists who in many cases may not have had a lot of exposure to the principles or understanding of kaitiangatanga or um, mana whenua what that means and what the responsibilities are and so it's combining that and it works incredibly well. It's really, really nice. And so as a result, how I now approach working in native bush or working on native plants or anything like that is completely different from what I did 10 years ago. Absolutely, completely different. And I think that's a really important role of Narako Takitaki is cementing that these practices should be normalized. They happen every day and providing ways to, for, for Western scientists to be able to do that more easily and appropriately. One of the areas which is potentially the hardest for scientists to comprehend and get around is the, the plant materials or the specimens aren't theirs. They don't belong to the scientist. The scientist holds them and might be a custodian of them, but they don't belong to us and that ability that if mana whenua says would like our material back, that you give that material back to um, whoever you'd borrowed it from or held it in custody and, um, from. And I think that's probably one of the biggest hurdles to get over, is that ability to let go. Um, and but, but as that becomes more understood, it, it becomes an easier, process for scientists to get over. The knowledge that the Māori co-leads have brought and that combination with that Western science I think is really valuable. We each learn from each other and it just enriches that whole knowledge that we have and the ability to do things. So I think it's great. I love it. I'm engaged in it because I've been engaged particularly in the Cody dieback space for over a decade and um, you know, these species, the Cody, the Mertaceae species are, for me, I'm a, I'm a woman from Taitokero. These are like really central to our identity. Um, in fact, um, from, from myself, we actually, in our pipiha, we have a, have a um, place we call Puke Cody. So um, you start to think what the world would look like if, <laughs> You know, if these um, parts of our, these, you know, these um, rako that we fuck a papa to weren't there or were changed, and it almost feels like a um, a, a, th a threat to our existence and to our identity. So it's really strong. I have a really strong um, feeling about protecting these, um, being involved in the protection of these species going forward as much as we can, because it's really, you know, it's a, it's a central sort of foundational part of, of who who I am and who um, our wider whānau and hapū are. So it's almost like just kaitiaki tanga at its most basic level on behalf of yourself, your whānau, your hapū. I think we feel like this is a, is, is a real opportunity now to actually get things happening. It feels like there's real movement associated with it. Um, there was a lot of, I guess, bureaucracy. There's, 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 we've always been sort of tied up in processes and bureaucracy, and, and and now it sort of feels more like the people who are actually going to be doing the mahi are the ones who are, I guess, holding the reins to an extent. It's sort of leveled out the playing field. So there's not this, um, feeling of everything cascading down and right down at the bottom you might have kaitiaki mana whenua who have been you know calling out for things now it feels like we're we're like really involved and we're we're in leadership roles as well as throughout the layers of I guess organization 
um, in this in this program. So that's what feels quite different. I think it probably has its challenges as well. I mean, it is a different way of working for a lot of the people that are involved. But I think once we get this right, which is why it's so important that we get to Whakahoninga, um cemented in place and implemented, I think it's going to be really um, quite remarkable what we can what we can achieve. If we come together as a community and as we work together with the community, and the community can be those who are there in that area, but it extends out to anyone who's involved uh, in, in that area. If we work together and pull together and bring our resources, bring our knowledge, and everybody does the mahi, then it can have a really significant difference.